Almighty God, we come before your throne, thanking you, Father, for all that you give for us, for all the opportunities you give us and for calling us, Father. There's so much to be grateful for. Thank you for opening our minds. And as we now begin this lesson, please, Father, help us to learn, open our minds to really and to go deep into it and appreciate everything. Father, we ask your blessing now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen and thank you and good, good evening and good morning to everybody. Uh, let's uh, proceed with our study today as you may have seen in the, uh, in the, uh, the group. We are actually going to continue with what I started some time back and that is the story of the church or uh, church history. Um, I'm just picking up uh, the essentials of, uh, uh, let me just see, I'm just setting my screen here, right. Um, uh, so we continue with that particular topic of studying various highlights of uh, events that happened in church history down through the ages, beginning from the times of the apostles. So, Today, we uh, are going to move into, you could say, well, almost the 8th century, that is close to 800 years after Jesus Christ. Uh, we have been through, you know, the early apostles. Uh, we looked at some of the councils, beginning with the first council, the Jerusalem council. We've seen the development of theology over the years, uh, or I should say decades and centuries. Uh, and uh, the development of, you know, the whole Trinitarian perspective, the heresies that uh, existed and came through with, you know, some people teaching all kinds of things. Uh, so we are slowly moving towards, you know, uh, the, uh, the church, the United Church, as we know, because once we hit the 1000 years after Christ, there comes a major split. So we will probably take that up in the days to come. But today I'm going to deal with something that happened in the uh, eighth century. And the title of my message today is, is veneration of icons and images biblically permitted? Uh, and in that respect, we will talk about the seventh ecumenical council. And of course, I, I want to leave or rather end with the GCI position on display of a cross uh, in the church. As usual, uh, I will always pick up some historical facts and then very briefly mention the Seventh Ecumenical Council, uh, what, what it had to deal with, and then we'll look at the theology, all right? So we are going to discuss uh, icons, images that we see in churches. Uh, I don't, I didn't uh, take the time to put any pictures, but I, but I do have some scriptures to refer to. So in any church that you go, sometimes you see all kinds of different types of icons. Some churches have relics, which uh, some churches hold as sacred. Uh, and let's ask the question, when did the depiction of these icons, religious images begin? Uh, and the technical word that we will use here is iconography. Icono iconography basically means a pictorial material relating to or illustrating a subject, especially religious or even legendary, right? So a pictorial representation of uh, religious uh, figures or events, uh, and they are supposedly symbolic, all right? So even in Christianity, there is a very, very rich history of iconography, uh, these pictorial representations, and some of the old churches you will see you know, all of these different kinds of uh, uh, pictures displayed. So 
beginning of religious iconography, obviously, you know, uh, was much, much before Christianity. Uh, even in the animist religions and the ancient religions, uh, a lot of these things existed. But what about the Bible? What about Christianity? Uh, did it begin only in the church era? Did it begin with, you know, uh, in the New Testament era or when churches were being built? Well, for that, let's look at a scripture uh, in the book of Exodus. And I'm going to share my screen right now. And just give me a moment to do that. Okay. Let me see. Okay, that's the, uh, if you can see the screen, it is, uh, you will see the title of uh, our, uh, our topic today is veneration of icons and images biblically permitted. And of course we will, like I said, very briefly mention the seventh ecumenical council and we'll end with the GCI position on display of a cross in a church. I am going to Exodus chapter 25 and Beginning from verse 17, I'll read it for you as it is on your screen. Make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, and make two cherubims out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim in one piece with the cover at the two ends. And verse 20 reads, the cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. You will probably notice as you read through this scripture that uh, pictorial representation of so-called you know, religious uh, things didn't begin with the church. It began right there back in, you know, with the Israelites and God himself giving instructions on how to do this. Notice it says, uh, uh, make two cherubim, you know, those are angelic beings and uh, they, I don't know how they looked. Uh, once again, I don't have any pictures to show you, but they definitely were representative of you know, uh, something in heaven, all right? So if you remember Exodus 25 is, I think the, the time when the Ark of the Covenant was to be uh, installed. And so you have representation, pictorial or, or, the, or this, uh, this kind of representation even during the time of the nation of Israel. Now, in Exodus 26, it, uh, it continues by saying, I don't have it on the screen, but it says, make the tabernacle with 10 curtains of finely twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with cherubim woven into them by a skilled worker. So this is more like, you know, a painting, you could say, but it is curtains with the picture of cherubims. All right, so pictorial representations started long back. But is there a contradiction here? If you go to Exodus chapter 20, uh, sorry, yeah, it's Exodus 20, notice what God says when he was giving the commandments. Exodus 20, I'm going to read you verse 4 or 4 and 5. Notice it says, you shall not make for yourselves an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. You know, in Exodus 20, you got God instructing uh, the Israelites not to make anything that is an image of a, or a form of anything in heaven above. But in Exodus 25, we have instructions on how to make 
these things. All right. So uh, let me just stop sharing there. So um, is there a contradiction here? Uh, what is what is happening? Right. Um, and some people would like to uh, solve the contradiction by saying that there is a difference between uh, a distinction between an idol and an icon. All right. Uh, in other words, there is a difference between veneration and worship. Veneration is different from worship. And if God allowed for some pictorial representation of something in heaven, then perhaps he's alluding to the fact that we are not to worship it, but like the people in the, in, in, in the Christian era would say, it's okay to venerate it, all right? So I just bring those thoughts, just, you know, once again, I'm not solving any problem here. We do know that God does not want worship of any image or idol or any of that sort. But on the other hand, he himself asked Israelites to make these uh, representation, religious representations for themselves. All right. I'm going to now move from there straight into the Christian era. Okay. And it is believed that uh, actually among the, the Eastern the Eastern Orthodox Church, uh, there is a belief that icons go back to the earliest days of the church, uh, even during, maybe even during the times of the apostles. But this is disputed because there is no proof of the fact that, you know, there were icons even in the first century, uh, you know, uh, church. But the Eastern Orthodox Church tends to believe that. Through uh, historical records, we seem to come to icons or we find icons or images only in the third century. That is 200 years after the beginning of the church. So the first recognizable Christian art appears in motif form, you know, borrowed from common non-Christian art and appropriated for Christian use. All right, so it's almost 200 years after the beginning of the church that you begin to see icons, images in places of worship and especially in churches. And what happened was after that, this particular practice gradually developed. It kept on building on itself and down the line, it was officially adopted uh, centuries after the first Christians, all right? It became a common practice, but as usual, when something become common practice, a fight begins. Some people say yes, some people say no. And then they had to be, uh, you know, they had to come together to sort this matter out. So what was the controversy? And this was what led to the seventh ecumenical council in AD 787, all right? So let's look at what the controversy was. What was the controversy? The controversy focused on icons, obviously, pictures of Christ, uh, the saints, or holy events, or as it is mentioned in the Greek, the, the, uh, the Theotokos, which is a representation of the mother of God who is Mary. So all of these pictures and images began to develop uh, in, the, in these years. And when the controversy started, it, it, it lasted for 120 years. They kept going back and forth. Even after the Seventh Ecumenical Council, they still had problems and people fight, fought over it. And the fight started in 726 AD. All right, now what? Well, the two camps, obviously, when there is a fight, there are two camps. The first camp is called the iconoclasts, also called icon smashers. <laughs> they were suspicious of any art depicting God or humans. 
they demanded the destruction of icons because they saw icons as idolatry. So very clearly, this camp of people uh, condemned images, icons as idolatry. But the other camp called the icono, iconodules, also called venerators of icons, they defended the place of icons in the church. And so the controversy kept raging on, which uh, led to the seventh council where a number of church leaders uh, came together in Nicaea. If you remember Nicaea, that was the council where we had, uh, uh, you know, Constantine, uh, the emperor decided to convene it and they discussed the deity of Jesus. So this is supposedly the seventh and the last ecumenical council of the United Church. When I say United Church, the church was one. West and East, uh, there was no split between the West and East. The, West, the, the split takes place in 1056 AD, which we will discuss uh, later on. But now the church is united, though you have the, it is one Orthodox Catholic church, all right? The Roman Catholic church didn't exist at that time. Neither did the Greek Orthodox or the, you know, the, as we call it, the Orthodox. They are all, all one United Church. So this was the last ecumenical council of the United Church. It's also called the Second Council of Nicaea because this is the second time they were meeting in Nicaea. Okay, AD 787. That was the year in which they met. And uh, once again, I am just very, you know, concising the whole, you know, debate. The decision was that they, they upheld, the council upheld the icon or duels position, which means that they allowed the use of icons in the church. What they proclaimed was as follows, icons are to be kept in churches and honored with the same relative veneration as is shown to other material symbols, such as the precious and life-giving cross and the book of the gospels. Even the book of the gospels, the, 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 the Bible uh, in gospel form was like an icon. Uh, it was placed at very strategic location, maybe on the altar. And on occasion, the priest would kiss the Bible or kiss certain other icons. And so Iconography, ico, I, the, the, the use of icons was allowed by the Seventh Ecumenical Council of the United Church. Um, they also went on to say the doctrine of icons is tied to the orthodox teaching that all of God's creation is to be redeemed and glorified, both spiritual and material. So that was the decision given by the council and uh, allowed the use of icons. But like I said, the fight didn't stop there. They carried on arguing and debating and some uh, said no, some said yes, uh, some vehemently opposed icons in the church, all right? So that is the, uh, the history, historical facts. Like I said, uh, fairly brief, uh, but I want to move on to what really interests me, and that is uh, the theology, all right? How do we look at icons today? For that, we need to, we need to once again go back and look at the arguments. Uh, those who are for icons and images and those who are against icons and images. If you look at the arguments, it will give us some grounding, some perspective on how we can look at it today, all right? So... Let me then bring you the arguments for icons, the camp that says icons should be allowed in churches. All right. For that, I think, uh, give me a moment to bring back my screen. Right. Okay. All right. Now uh, you will see that I've taken this from a source. I quoted the source 
uh, on the top. And I'm putting forward here what is uh, what was argued as in favor of having icons in churches. It says, icons are necessary and essential because they protect the full and proper doctrine of the incarnation. While God cannot be represented in his eternal nature, that is, no man has seen God, uh, quoted from John 1.18, he can be depicted simply because he became human and took flesh. Of him who took a material body, material images can be made. In so taking a material body, God provide, approved rather that matter can be redeemed. He deified matter, that is debatable. He deified matter, making it spirit bearing. And so if flesh can be a medium for the spirit, so can wood or paint, although in a different fashion. All right. Um, so this is what uh, they they have said, and they also go on to say, which I don't have on the screen here, they say, icons are open books to remind us of God. Those who lack the time or learning to study theology need only to enter a church to see the mysteries of the Christian religion unfolded before them. Actually, I, I think I have that on the screen. Yes, there you are. Let me just read that again so that you catch it. Uh, they are open books to remind us, that is icons, are open books to remind us of God. Those who lack the time or learning to study theology need only to enter a church to see the mysteries of the Christian religion unfolded before them. Okay. Uh, so what the... Uh, those who argue for icons and images are basically saying is that they are essential for people to understand, especially those who cannot read and write, the illiterate, the uneducated, those who are not able to read the Bible. It is essential for them to have some pictorial representation of the divine, of the holy, of the sacred, uh, and it should be included in the in a liturgical veneration. All right, and I want you to notice that word veneration, right? These people believe that they serve as mediums of instruction for the uneducated faithful. That's a very interesting argument. You know, those who are unable to know anything about or who are uneducated, uh, there is. Uh, something interesting that they have to say there. Now, I'd like to bring in one thought, which these people who argue for icons and images bring out very, very, uh, I mean to say very clearly, they want us to understand the distinction between veneration and worship. All right. <laughs> now, this can be semantics for some, but for these people, certainly not. Uh, they believe that uh, veneration can be different from worship. Okay, what is veneration? Veneration is an act of giving respect or showing adoration for something or someone. And they believe that this is not to be confused with worship. In fact, uh, uh, as stated by uh, Carlo Brossard, who is a Catholic uh, and he writes the following, he says, a Catholic theologian, he says, the respect and reverence that Catholics give to sacred objects is not of the same kind of respect or reverence given to God. And those who argue for icons and worship also bring the Jews in. You see, the Jewish, the Jews are very, very careful about uh, idolatry. You know, they are extremely, uh, you know, careful with regards to worshiping anything other than God. In fact, they are so careful even not to mention the name of God because uh, they are afraid they might desecrate the holy name. But interestingly enough, the Jews have certain practices, which is continued on even today, 
right from the times of the Israelites, uh, which is something that those who argue for the veneration of icons use as a proof that veneration is different from worship. For example, it, it's a, a pious Jew will kiss what is called the mezuzah. You know, the mezuzah is a parchment inscribed with religious texts and attached in a case to the doorpost of a, of a Jewish home. You probably have seen that maybe in movies, uh, Jewish homes, uh, just on the side of the main door, they will have a little part of the Torah and they will touch it and kiss it or even kiss it on the wall. And this, and they believe that is a kind of veneration. Every time a Jew or a, or a rabbi reads the Torah in the synagogue, he kisses the Torah, I think before and after, <laughs> or sometimes after, sometimes before, or sometimes both. The Jews also use prayer shawls, you know, and apparently they kiss it before putting it on. And if you remember, there is something called, the Jews call the talanin, which means they tie something on the forehead, which is a strap, a leather strap, and then it goes around their arm. And what is on the forehead is again, I think a, a scripture or part of uh, you know, the Torah that they tie on their forehead. And uh, they, they, they kiss it before tying it on their forearm and forehead. They, the people who argue for icons use these examples as a sort of veneration and it is not worship. They are using material things to venerate or to show respect, not necessarily to worship. And I was just thinking about this and I felt it is interesting that, you know, this difference between the so-called veneration and worship, once again, you know, there are others who don't believe in it. But, uh, you know, I was looking at in India, there is a practice and, and once again, some of you might be able to help me understand better. Uh, many will in India, the practice of touching the feet of parents or elders. And on many occasions, I have had to, you know, literally move away from somebody who came, you know, thinking me to be an old man and, and I am old. <laughs> <laughs> and they will touch my feet. And so uh, that is a form of, I don't know, is it a form of respect or is it a form of worship? I am not sure how the Hindus look at it, but I felt that is a form of veneration. All right. So uh, those who use the argument for use of uh, icons also go to Polika. Polycarp was one of the disciples of John in the first century. And one of the sayings of Polycarp goes like this. He says, Christ, we worship as the son of God. Martyrs, that is saints who are martyred, we love as disciples. In other words, love is different from worship or there is some kind of a distinction. Now, there can be an overlap. But there is some kind of a distinctions, distinction between love and worship. Love is more veneration and worship is, you know, much, much more intense. And there is a, there is a reason for that. If you remember the great commandment, what does it say? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, right? And then what's the second part of it? Love your neighbor. Now, if you say love is worship, then it also says love your neighbor. You should worship your neighbor. So they use the argument that love or veneration is not worship. So you can venerate without worshiping. So that is the argument used by those who come against uh, the use of icons and images. Now, okay, so that is, uh, uh, let's go to the second camp. The second camp is, those who are against, uh, you know, icons and images, right? They say worship is at the act of acknowledging worthiness, worship, you know, worthiness. And so 
And this camp is mainly the Protestant camp, argue that venerating or showing respect and honor is the same as worship. So here you literally come down to semantics. Does worship, does veneration mean worship? Some say no and some say yes. Protestant Christians do not believe that saints or the mother of God, Mary, or items or any items deserve special honor. The saints are human beings just like them who trusted in the Lord as their savior and hence must not be worshiped. That's very clear, right? But the question is veneration, all right? Um, they go on to argue items such as the crucifix or relics do not hold any special power and do not need to be the focus of adoration, right? Although Protestants agree that we may learn from the lives of other Christians, including the mother of God, Mary, they believe that venerating or worshiping anyone other than God is unbiblical. And one of the very strong proponents of this who argued against the use of icons is John Calvin, uh, even down at the time of the Reformation. John Calvin, along with those who followed him, were, as they call, iconoclasts, which means they were against icons and they demanded the removal of icons from churches and homes. So what is their conclusion? Their conclusion is the veneration of icons and other religious artifacts was idolatry, the breaking of the second commandment. All right. Now, these people who are so vehemently against the use of icons do have something interesting to say, and I'd like to just bring that up on the screen this time. Uh, just let me read you a little bit about uh, what they indicate with regards to uh, you know, icons and images. These Protestants were against the uh, icons uh, and images. And I'm quoting from a, a reformed perspective. This is how a reformed uh, Christian would look at it. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, let me just see, did I? Uh, no, it looks like, a, sorry, I don't have that. Uh, I don't have that thing on the screen, but let me read it to you. I'm sorry, I completely forgot to put it on the screen. Here, here it goes, the quotation. They say there is nothing wrong with producing or enjoying religious art per se. Viewing a painting of a biblical scene in an art gallery and admiring the artist's technique cannot be considered idolatry. Having a picture of Jesus or of angels in one's home may not be idolatry either. Iconography can be studied as an art form and icons can be viewed as fascinating examples of historical religious art. But using icons to aid one's worship or viewing them as a window to heaven is definitely idolatry. So <laughs> what is our conclusion? Is it right to venerate, not worship, I, uh, icons or images? Is it okay to have icons, images at home? Well, some Protestants believe that's the reformed thinking of uh, many of these uh, you know, uh, Protestants. They say it's perfectly all right to have art at home uh, re depicting religious events or scenes or, or, or even pictures of Jesus but you should not venerate them, which is what the other camp says. My personal take on this, and remember this is my own, my personal one. You might have something that, uh, which is different from what I have, uh, which I, I conclude. I feel this comes under what we can call as disputable matters. <laughs> okay. Disputable matters. In Romans chapter 14, uh, verse 1 says the following. It says, 
accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. And what are disputable matters? Disputable matters can be summed up as non-essential issues in the Christian life or those that fall under gray area, neither white nor black, right? Gray areas. Gray areas in which the Bible does not spell out very clear guidelines with regards to that particular matter. And I feel there are many things that fall under that. For example, what about saluting the flag? We just celebrated the 75th Independence Day of our beloved country. And we hoisted a flag in the, in the church premises. And uh, our freedom fighter, Mr. Sanjeev Rao, uh, had the honors of hoisting the flag. We prayed for the country. We sang the national anthem. Now that is all symbolic. Is that wrong? Is it worshiping the country? Is it worshiping the flag? Question mark, right? Disputable matters. Let's take another one. Kissing the photo of a loved one. Right? I've seen how many times in wallets people have photos of their loved ones. I have several photos of my grandchildren and I adore looking at them. You could say I venerate them. <laughs> no, don't worship them. Uh, is that right? Is it wrong? Kissing the Bible. Is it wrong to kiss the Bible? Uh, I would say it's wrong to worship the Bible, the, 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 the material text, but uh, kissing the Bible, is it wrong? Pasting verses on the wall. I've seen many Christians home, Christian home, if I'm not mistaken, maybe Anil has one right at the back there. I'm not sure if it's a, it's a, it's a verse, <laughs> but I can see uh, you know, a picture there. <laughs> <laughs> but many Christian homes have verses of the Bible on the wall, and some of them don't even know what that verse is, but they look at it with a sense of veneration. They give it some importance, all right? Uh, may I be a little bit more controversial? Having a gun in the house, <laughs> is that... Is that biblical? You know, I remember the words of Jesus when the apostle Peter took out his sword and Jesus said, put your sword back in its place. Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. And so the question is, is it right to have a gun in the house as a symbol of, you know, protection or whatever? The question here is veneration and worship. I don't know the heart of someone who says he venerates an icon, but does not worship it. I don't know his heart. Just as I don't know the heart of someone who kisses the Bible. And there I believe this comes under disputable matters and I would only leave it to the best judgment of the person, okay? So that is what I'd like to leave you with. And, uh, and let me come back a little later. I'll just open it up for some comments. And I'll give you the GCI position on uh, the display of the cross. So let me stop there and request you to bring in either any thoughts you have, questions. And as usual, Suryamurthy is going to uh, be the first one. Go ahead, Suryamurthy. Uh, we can't hear you, Surya Murthy. Can you? Uh... Praveen, can we hear Surya Murthy for some reason? Uh, okay, for some reason we can't hear you. Uh, are you? Maybe you should turn up the volume. Probably turn up the volume. What would you suggest, uh, uh, Praveen, uh, that he logs in again? Yeah. So, Better again. 
Can you just log in again and then we'll entertain your question. In the meantime, anybody else, please come up with your comments. Veneration and worship. Yes, I think let's have Bertie first and then Anil. Go ahead, Bertie. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Um, we have died to the old self and we have uh, put on the new self which is created after God in true righteousness and holiness. So I think we are, should be careful that we trust in Christ. Uh, blessed are they who have not seen me yet, uh, uh, yet believe. You know, uh, the Lord mentioned to uh, the Apostle Thomas. Uh, faith plays a very vital role in our Christian living. We have, uh, uh, we have now, we say we, we are now Christ's uh, 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 members of the body of Christ, disciples of Christ. Uh, 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 God has accepted us in his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So I feel, uh, you know, the reading the word, it should be biblically uh, what God reveals in his word. We should be going by it to uh, so that we don't, uh, you know, don't defy, uh, you know, any item. Like uh, now you have altars and all, this, all, all these Catholic homes, altars. There's a picture of Jesus and uh, Mary next to him. There are, you know, saints, also little figurines, figurettes, figurines, you know. And, uh, you know, uh, they feel that, you know, by looking at it, you know, they feel they are, would you call it veneration? Would you call it, uh, you know, would you call it worship? Uh, and when they, these Catholics, they come before the altar, like, you know, like, uh, like, uh, like uh, this uh, other works, uh, 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 other works, uh, uh, and the works of by men, where these idols, idolatry, you know, murtis they call it, and uh, even they go, they show faith in gurus. Uh, just today, I heard somebody equating uh, like uh, Jesus Christ with uh, some other guru. Just like you know about one, uh, I have a PG who was just mentioning about how essential that we should go by the gurus, you know, uh, gurus advice, gurus uh, example and other things. And yet uh, he says, yeah, like guru, like uh, he mentioned, he was talking about, just like Jesus Christ is a guru, you know. I, I didn't want to enter into any, uh, any uh, uh, talking with him, but uh, you know, for him, uh, Jesus Christ is on the same plane like his guru, Satguru, or somebody else, this, that, and all. I feel, uh, first of all, our, our unique, this thing is, we believe in the sovereignty of Jesus Christ, and we believe in the love of God, okay, that makes uh, us, you, uh, you know, a people that are faithful towards God and faithful to the word of God. Uh, in that sense, uh, these uh, venerable things, uh, don't make a, you know, don't uh, uh, aid me or don't help me in okay. in coming to know God, reminding me of God, or even uh, pleasing God to that extent. I would feel that would uh, rather, this was done in my pre-conversion day in, as a Catholic. I would wear a medal or some people wear a rosary and some people have uh, all sorts of, you know, trinkets, you know, and make it feel... Uh, you know that that's part of their you know that their belief part of their living a Christian life. Right. Now, a Christian life. Uh, there are religions in the world, uh, and with most of the religion, including Judaism, yeah. Judaism also, if you permit me to say, has become a religion. Uh, like all other religions, and uh, they depend upon what's written in the you know in their religion and go. But we are called in Christ. We are. So in Christ. So, so Bharti, what you're really saying is, if I can yeah. just... Uh, faith, faith is more important. Faith. Yeah. What you're saying is, icons, images of any of these things are not necessary, but are you also saying they are definitely wrong and idolatrous? Uh, it, I, 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 <laughs> I, can't, I can't draw a line that okay. because okay. Uh, definitely there's all these uh, altars 
right right and all these uh, murti pujas you know where they have little even my own house one pg is having something in his own room there and i'm not i have no contact with them but uh, what are they doing they getting garlands and they getting this okay. and all sure. that we got uh, your points basically <coughs> they are definitely not necessary yeah okay uh, let me see uh, i think uh, can we go to suryamurthy and then come to you anil or anil uh, did you want to That's say fine. okay no, suryamurthy no, no. go ahead uh your volume is very low suryamurthy for some reason i don't know why this time i don't think he has spoken yet sorry uh can you speak suryamurthy can you let's just see if he can hear you for some reason we are not able to catch you <laughs> i don't know why i don't think he is speaking i can't i can't i don't think he is speaking uh no he he tried to say a few words but uh is there right i i yeah we can't catch him uh just just have a look at your uh, uh, your settings once again perhaps uh, you can just redo that again right anil go ahead in the meantime we'll have anil question well uh, i was going to say that there there is a, a very fine line between veneration and worship it takes just but a step to move from veneration to worship and sometimes the the distinction there is also clouded you know because the way people venerate it's as if they are worshiping so i i really uh, find it difficult to you know have a very clear distinction between these two things maybe it's semantics but i personally feel that veneration is very very close to worship that's one okay. second you mentioned that scripture exodus uh, where you know the, the cherubs uh, yeah. uh, molded image and all that now that is is not really for worship or even for maybe for veneration but you know that that is just an object in which you know you're talking about the mercy seat right where the yeah. cherubs are there on the thing i mean that's perfectly fine i mean the, the, those those uh, maybe images as in heaven but uh, that is not really for worship yeah. god had said that is the receptacle in which you will place the ark uh, of the covenant and so on but uh, that's what i feel uh, that other people may feel no that you're worshiping those cherubs which is not really right right so what uh, i what uh, i can conclude with what you said anil is that um you can have these objects but you definitely should not worship them oh absolutely <laughs> right <laughs> and veneration can be fairly close to worship once again that that will depend on the individual right i mean uh, right right that is where and i even, yeah and even like uh, it's okay to make images and idols but it's okay to make images and idols of objects not of persons now you know you, you, i and that's my feeling like making a image of christ or image of mary or uh, image of uh, angels and stuff like that uh, i would feel not very comfortable with that okay all right okay anyone else would like to comment unfortunately surya murthy is uh, not able to communicate uh, right uh if i can just bring one thought here and uh, frankly did you want to say something i'm sorry if i missed you uh, no sir nothing nothing to add okay okay all right you know uh, with what i little i understand is when you talk about idolatry people makes images or they make statues or idols uh and they actually believe that a god resides in that and they worship the idol because of the god residing in that idol now veneration may be different because you don't believe that god is in that picture or an icon or whatever you are only using that as a uh what do you call it something to remind you of you know a, a different world there is a different world you know once again i i i, I can't speak for somebody who's venerating an a, a, an icon uh 
uh, you know, in churches, you see them kissing and bowing. And uh, once again, I cannot speak for them what is in their heart. But if I can just bring that distinction between worship, the way some people worship, and I think idolatry is believing that particular item can save you or it has magical powers or whatever. I think that is worship, probably worship. Okay. So I'll just bring that thought. Surimurti, go ahead. <laughs> For some reason, we still can't hear you. We are very sorry about that. I mean, uh, you, uh, Surimurti, could you could you put it in your chat? Uh, can you type in your question in your chat box and maybe I can then read it for everyone? Probably we can do that. Okay. In the meantime, before time goes away, let me just bring you the GCI position on uh, the cross. And I thought it may be necessary for me to share this with you. I'll bring up the screen at this time. Uh, Okay, yeah, GCI position on the cross. I've got two screens, so I will read the first screen and uh, I'm reading from the screen. Some have asked whether it would be a sin to display a cross in church services. Others have asked whether it would be wrong to have a cross on a bracelet, a necklace, in a picture, on a keychain, and so forth. Unless the cross becomes an object of worship in these uses, it is not a sin to wear or display one any more than it is to sin. It is a sin to wear a church seal or on jewelry or display it on the lectern at services. Such a thing is entirely a personal choice. Just as the church cannot demand any that anyone use the word cross, it can certainly not demand that anyone remove a cross on a necklace, keychain, or a Bible binding. Let me read you the next screen. To summarize, the cross of Christ has rich meaning for Christians as a powerful symbol of the relationship with God, who gave his son that we might die to sin and live in him. We need not be ashamed of it, and we need not be offended by it. The cross is not to be worshipped, but neither should it be disparaged as sinful. Because some people might wrongly worship the cross must not mean that other Christians cannot use it rightly as a symbol of Jesus' profound sacrifice for sin. So there you have it. That's uh, our GCI position on, on it, on uh, a symbol like the cross. Uh, Surimurthy, did you type in your question? Uh, Probably not. Okay. All right. <laughs> For some reason, yeah, we still can't hear you. I don't know why. Any other thoughts or comments as we wrap up for today? I, I realize that, you know, as Anil, you said, veneration and worship, sometimes they can be a thin line. But I feel it is safer for us to not pass judgment over those who might use an icon or whatever, you know, we leave it for that individual to understand why, oh, you know, why they are doing it. Uh, and that's why I would like to place it under disputable matters uh, and leave it for the individual to decide. Yes, uh, Vanessa, go ahead. into the synagogue and the first time that he read the scriptures what did he do what did he do when he when he read the scriptures the first time remind us Savannah, i'm not sure exactly what you're referring to uh, no i'm asking okay. uh, when when jesus went up to read the scriptures to the people in the synagogue right. he, he first covered his head i think 
Uh, I am not sure if that is what the scripture says. Yeah, okay. I read it in the Bible. It is he covered his head and he took the uh, the scriptures. I think he kissed it or something, and then he started reading it. Uh, I am not sure if that is the biblical account in Luke chapter four. Can somebody just uh, refer to that and maybe read it so that we can get the right one? I'm not the sure. Time, the first time when he he got up to read the scriptures, what what were his actions? Did you do you have that scripture in front of you by any chance? No, not no. Okay. <laughs> I just I just remembered this. I just remembered this. So uh, that and and another thing, I think in the Bible it also says that uh, to put up uh, around the house uh, place uh, scripture verses around the house to remind your children uh, something like that. Also, is there in the Bible? Uh, Yes, that is in the Old Testament. The Israelites were supposed to do that. Yes, correct. I can read the Luke 4 if you like. Yeah, go ahead and read that. Uh, it says here, verse uh, from verse uh, 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Then he quotes from the Bible, the spirit on the, of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. So he doesn't kiss the Bible. He doesn't cover his head. He just takes the book and starts reading it. Thank you, Anil. Uh, Vanessa, so does that clarify any question you may have had? Okay. At least we don't have any record of Jesus doing that. So obviously we don't know if uh, you read it anywhere else. But we, we do know that Jews do it in synagogues today. The rabbis, before they read, they will kiss uh, the Torah uh, either before or after. But they, they, yes, they do that. <laughs> Any other? Yes, uh, Bertram, go ahead. Uh, could we have uh, some comments from uh, Pastor Praveen? <laughs> go ahead, Pastor Praveen. Yeah, definitely, it is one of the very um, one of the topic where we could not pass any judgments as such. Uh, but at the same time, there are people who are comfortable with the usage of icons. For the, some people, it will be uh, some kind of spiritual reminder, and it helps them to grow in spirituality. And for some, it is not required uh, any spiritual icons or spirit, uh, religious icons for them to. Uh, study, uh, I mean, study about, I mean, uh, to remind them about their spirituality and to grow. So uh, we don't, we cannot pass any kind of judgment on this, but one thing is for sure, we cannot take any extreme sides of uh, uh, these, these two also iconography or iconoclasticism. Uh, we also have seen um, uh, people becoming aggressive and de de disturbing the relationship based on that, I guess, uh, uh, is something that is uh, unhealthy for we Christians and uh, we for we brethren. And another thing uh, we need to understand is we should not become any stumbling block by our uh, theological or uh, philosophical idolatry. Uh, we cannot impose that on anybody and cause us any kind of uh, uh, hindrance for them to grow in their faith and grow in the knowledge of uh, Jesus Christ. So. Uh, what what we need to do is we need, we should be having an attitude to accept everybody. Uh, one one example we can see from Bible is when a Canaanite woman came to Jesus to ask uh, uh, to ask him uh, to heal her daughter. Uh, Jesus never told her, go, you change your religion and become a Jew and throw off all the idols from your house and then I will heal your daughter. He didn't do that. He reached out to the very need of uh, her and then uh, I definitely believe that their lives might have been changed. So we should be having the attitude of Jesus Christ 
where we uh, though we don't appreciate others practices uh, but we should be able to accept it so this study should help us uh, I, I personally feel we should not take any extreme positions of iconography or iconoclasticism and we know what happened uh, in the recent years when isis was ruling in the middle east they have destroyed a huge and great uh, historical monuments in the world in the name of iconoclasticism, you know, the kind of damage they have made and uh, how they have caused some kind of hindrance for us to study our uh, history and all, right? Such kind of extremism is not at all uh, healthy and pushing. Uh, and uh, one thing I really need to mention, a uh, lot of Protestant Christians without understanding the concept of veneration and how a Catholic is venerating uh, Mother Mary, or uh, and without understanding that, a lot of Protestant Christians they make comments on Catholics, and they judge them as idol worshippers, they judge them as pagans, and all that is something we should not be doing. And Jesus did not even uh, judge the Canaanite woman. How could we judge our Catholic brethren? So we should be able to accept them once we are able to accept and love them. And uh, they definitely, uh, that, that's why we are truly sharing the gospel. And then it is a personal choice. They can wear, they can have it, they, can, they don't need to have it. That is the personal choice Be based on their kind of spiritual life. Every person's spiritual life is different. For some people, it will be more influence. Their spiritual life will be more benefited and growing by uh, theological, intellectual growth. As much as their intellect, theological understanding grows, biblical understanding grows, their spiritual life will be growing. For some, for some people, it will be more of service. As much service as they do, they feel the kind of growth in their spiritual life. For some people, it is more of meditation. Or meditation in the sense like meditating on the word of God, it can be it can be prayer life. As much as they pray, they their spiritual life will be growing. For some people, this uh, some of this uh, art would be helpful. So uh, we cannot judge anyone and anyone's their base, spiritual life based on this, uh, and uh, we cannot expect everybody to be uh, in one particular kind of spiritual life because that itself has. Um, you know, millions of uh, facets, like, you know, millions of kinds of spiritual experiences are there. So uh, this is a small thing where we don't need to take it very strongly. We very strongly defend any particular position. That's what I feel where we need to, ex we need to respect the liberty that people have. Very good. Thank you. Praveen, and uh, I noticed the time has gone gone very quickly. And uh, let's close. And before we close, just want to mention, just uh, if, if, it, if the Holy Spirit brings it to your remembrance, just remember Eugene and me, we are going to Bangladesh next week. Uh, so I won't be here uh, for the study. Uh, we are doing this after a long time and uh, hoping that we can meet with our uh, newly, uh, you know, baptized members there meeting of course with Pastor, uh, Pastor Amil and uh, trying to do a little bit of training for the leaders there. So just remember us, thank you very much. And uh, to close, uh, is it okay to ask you Vanessa to lead us in a closing prayer? Is Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, we thank you that you gave us such a beautiful day that we could spend it with you knowing your greatness and your mercy towards us. I thank you for this evening, for giving each one of us time to spend with you to hear your good news and for all who share their news with us. I thank you for giving us the insight of what you want us to do and what we should do. Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, we thank you for this night that is now before us. I thank you for keeping us safe during the day. I thank you for the food and the shelter and the good health that you gave each one of us. We thank you in Lord Jesus Christ, your beloved son's name we pray. Amen. Amen and thank you. God bless you all. Have a good rest of the day.